the letter that promised the Jewish people their first homeland in nearly 2,000 years. It was taking up people who were constantly persecuted in all corners of the earth and finding them somewhere to go and live, a place where indigenously the Jews came from according to the Bible. See how the Balfour Declaration, issued 100 years ago, led to the creation of the modern state of Israel on today's 700 Club Interactive. Well, welcome to the show. Today we're going to do a little time travel. We're going to go back 100 years. In November 1917, the war to end all wars was raging throughout Europe, Africa, and the Middle East. The Ottoman Empire was on the brink of collapse, and British forces were poised to capture the city of Jerusalem. 100 years ago, the British government made a strategic announcement. It was time for the Jewish people to have a national home. The Balfour Declaration became the first step that led to the creation of the State of Israel 30 years later. Well, now we take a look both at the men who are both Jewish and Christian behind this historic proclamation. On November 2nd, 1917, the British government issued a letter that promised the Jewish people their first homeland in nearly 2,000 years. And with just 67 words, the map of the world changed forever. His Majesty's government view with favor the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavors to facilitate the achievement of this object, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine, or the rights and political status enjoyed by Jews in any other country. In 1917, the population of Palestine was predominantly Arab, so why did the British endorse a Jewish home in a region where only 7% of the people were Jews? The Balfour Declaration wasn't issued for the Jews in Palestine. It was issued for the Jews in desperate straits outside Palestine, and in particular, the Jews of the Russian Empire. There was a huge population of Jews who were in mortal danger. At the turn of the 20th century, some 2,000 Russian Jews were killed in a wave of bloody pogroms. Fifteen years later, during World War I, 600,000 more were deported because they were suspected of being pro-German. After the war, another 50,000 died in a new series of pogroms, and half a million were left homeless. There were at the time something over five million Jews in the Russian Empire. That was a larger population than the Arab population of the entire Levant. Palestine, Syria, Lebanon included all. Still only about four million at the time. It was the maximum good for the maximum number of people. And there were people here who were in desperate need of refuge. 14 years earlier, in 1903, Zionist leaders had asked Great Britain to provide a safe haven for the Russian Jews. In response, the British offered them land in Uganda, then under British control. Ultimately, the Zionists turned down the offer, but they had caught the attention of one of the attorneys who had helped draft the so-called Uganda scheme, a parliament member with a love for biblical history. David Lloyd George had been raised in a deeply religious home in Wales, where he had studied the history of the Jewish people. He had become convinced of their right to return to their biblical homeland, and often spoke of putting Israel back on the map and providing a national hearth and a refuge for the hunted children of Israel. 
During World War I, Lloyd George became Britain's first Minister of Munitions. And in this capacity, he met a scientist who shared his dream of a Jewish homeland. At the height of World War I, Great Britain experienced a critical shortage of acetone. The chemical needed to create the explosive in artillery cartridges. So a Jewish chemist in Manchester went to work and came up with a new way to create acetone by fermenting grain, corn, and even chestnuts. He worked day and night to reproduce it in mass quantities, and soon, the British were producing 90,000 gallons a year. The chemist who saved the British Army was a Russian Jewish man named Heim Weizmann, a Zionist leader who would one day become the first president of the State of Israel. Heim Weizmann was the chief architect of Zionist diplomacy. He was the one who formulated the case, and he did it in a very persistent way. He was a man of action totally driven, and also a charmer. And not only that, he put together a strategy. The strategy was to gain some kind of explicit endorsement of the Zionist movement, which would be a public one. In Manchester, Weizmann made a number of strategic friendships with members of the British government. During the war, he worked with Lloyd George to solve the munitions crisis. And nearly a decade earlier, he had met a former prime minister who became a lifelong friend. Lord Arthur James Balfour was born in eastern Scotland. And like David Lloyd George, his childhood was steeped in the stories of the Bible. He came from a very, very intellectual family. And they were all very pragmatic Protestants. The Bible was pretty central to, to everybody's education. You know, they would have read the Old Testament every Sunday. So they were brought up in a very religious way, not extreme, but just with intense education about the Bible. So it was very natural for anybody who was brought up in that environment to associate the Holy Land and the Jews. They weren't inextricably linked. After several years as a member of parliament, Balfour became prime minister in 1902. While in office, he supported the plan for a Jewish homeland in Uganda. A few years later, a friend introduced him to Heim Weizmann of Manchester University, and the two debated the merits of the Uganda scheme for more than an hour. But the Russian Jews need a safe haven immediately. Why not British East Africa? The survival of Zionism is based on a spiritual conviction. And that conviction is based on Palestine. And on Palestine alone. If Moses had been here when they had proposed Uganda, he would surely have broken the tablets once again. <laughs> Mr. Balfour, supposing I were to offer you Paris instead of London. Would you take it? <laughs> but Dr. Weizmann, we have London. That is true. And we had Jerusalem when London was nothing more than a marsh. Are there many Jews who think like you? I believe I speak the mind of millions of Jews who cannot speak for themselves. If that is so, Dr. Weizmann, then you will one day be a force. Lord Balfour had gone into the meeting hoping to change Weizmann's mind, but instead, he became the convert, and the Jewish people gained an ally in one of the most powerful men in England. In 1915, Weizmann's groundbreaking production of acetone was invaluable to the British war effort and he now had the ear of the most influential men in England. David Lloyd George later wrote in his memoirs 
that the Balfour Declaration was a reward for Weitzman's service to Britain. In response, Weitzman commented, I wish it had been as simple as that. In 1916, both of Weitzman's friends were promoted. David Lloyd George became the new prime minister, and Lord Balfour was now his foreign secretary. Together, they fought for the Zionist cause in the newly created British War Cabinet. Balfour and Lord George may have been motivated by religion or history, but the rest of the cabinet had more pragmatic reasons for being involved in the Middle East, including access to Arab oil and the Suez Canal. The War Cabinet signed off on a Jewish homeland in Palestine on one condition. Britain's European allies had to agree to the plan. So the Zionists turned to one of their most effective and least remembered diplomats. There's no question that uh, two other people deserve as much credit, I think, as, as Weizmann. One was Nachum Sokolov, who was his senior in the Zionist movement, and whose task was to get the buy-in of Britain's allies in Europe. Now, remember, Britain was part of a wartime alliance, and its primary allies at the time were France and Italy. It would have been inconceivable for Britain to have issued a commitment regarding territory yet to be conquered by this alliance without prior consultation with its allies. That was Sokolov's job. The British actually sent him to do it because they said, we can't issue this declaration unless our French allies are on board. And Sokolov not only got the buy-in of the French and the buy-in from the Italians, he even got the buy-in from the Vatican, which had been historically hostile to Zionism and which had thrown Herzl out. Sokolov got all that, and so that's his major contribution. Once the Europeans were on board, it was time to draft the text. And it may surprise you to learn that Lord Balfour didn't actually write the declaration that bears his name. Balfour was, of course, engaged in the process. He didn't just sit down and dictate the Balfour Declaration to his secretary. Sort of the unsung hero of the Balfour Declaration on the British side was Mark Sykes. It was as much Sir Mark Sykes' declaration as anyone else's. He was the one who met with the Zionists, and he shepherded the, the whole thing through, including the text. Balfour and Mark Sykes asked the Zionists to propose a text, and they did. Actually, Sokolov was the author of the text. And then once the text had been received, the British began back and forth editing it. The Zionists gave a text which was, let's say, more forthcoming than the final declaration. And it was Sykes who, after that cabinet meeting in which the Balfour Declaration was adopted, who stepped out of the meeting to meet with Weizmann in the ante room and told him, it's a boy. From the start, it was important for the declaration to be a public one. Herzl, 20 years earlier, had convened the first Zionist Congress. Herzl was a magnificent mobilizer and popularized the idea. He was a total failure as a diplomat. He didn't get any power to sign on to the Zionist project. Weizmann's genius in his strategy was to understand that what was needed was a public declaration. Once it was made public, once it was incorporated in the League of Nations mandate, once it became part of international law, it became a matter of British honor and credibility to uphold it. The declaration was issued in the form of a letter from Lord Balfour to one of Britain's most prominent Jewish leaders, Lord Walter Rothschild. It did include a phrase which I think is of crucial importance to understanding the breakthrough that it represented. Many people focus on the idea of national home. Nobody knew exactly what a national home meant. Sokolov was someone who said, let's keep it vague, but the word he used was pregnant, pregnant with meaning, so that it could be interpreted later. Because if you'd ask for a Jewish state at that point, there probably would have been too much opposition. But the key phrase I think there is the Jewish people. Remember, the Jews had been considered until that time as a religion. They were adherents of a faith. By describing them as a people, this is a transformation of the status of the Jews. It's from a religious community into peoplehood and nationhood. And that's a huge transformation in the status of Jews. As the draft evolved, the Zionists faced one more hurdle. 
when the United States declared war on Germany. Once the United States entered the war, it became clear that the British had to clear the Balfour Declaration with yet another ally. The British War Cabinet had made it quite clear that they would not issue a declaration unless the United States was on board. And again, they sent the Zionists on the mission to do just that. The Zionists enlisted Jewish Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis to present the plan to President Woodrow Wilson. At first, Wilson was very standoffish. But Brandeis was also persistent, just like Weizmann. And although initially Wilson rejected the notion of support for such a declaration, in October of 1917, he was shown the actual text and he had a change of heart. The British had finally won American support, but they still faced opposition here at home. And surprisingly, much of it came from the Jewish community. There was opposition within the cabinet by one of its Jewish members, Edwin Montague, who thought that the Balfour Declaration was, in fact, evidence of the anti-Semitism of the British government. Montague and other British Jews insisted they had as much right as any Christian to live in Great Britain. And they didn't want Weizmann forcing them to settle in the Judean desert or till the orange groves of Jaffa. Several British military leaders also opposed the declaration, arguing that it neglected the Arabs of Palestine. To satisfy their objections, new lines were added to the text, one emphasizing the rights of non-Jews in Palestine and another guaranteeing the rights of Jews who wish to remain in their current countries. What the Balfour Declaration does is that for the first time, a major power in the world comes forward in a public way and says, we recognize the right that the Jews claim for themselves. Remember, the Balfour Declaration doesn't explain itself. It doesn't mention historical rights. It doesn't mention divine provenance. It's simply a statement of intent. So it makes no justification for itself. But in some ways, that's the poetic virtue of the Balfour Declaration, in that it assumes that it needs no justification. The Jews have this right. It cannot be expressed in a formula. It cannot be boiled down to some glib sentence or two. It's fundamental. On November 2nd, 1917, the final letter signed by Balfour was sent to Lord Rothschild. A week after that, it was published in newspapers around the world. Leaflets of the text were then airdropped over Jewish communities in Germany, Austria, and parts of Russia. In Britain, still in the throes of a world war, reaction to the letter was underwhelming. When the government did it, it really didn't arouse a great deal of interest. The Balfour Declaration meant so much more in so many other countries other than Britain. In Palestine, the Arabs more than made up for the British response, with riots, boycotts, and attacks on Jewish settlements. It was the Jews who made the most of the opportunity, and the Arabs who made the least of the opportunity that was presented to them also in the Balfour Declaration. If they had acceded to the creation of a national home in parameters which might have been defined in negotiations with the Jews instead of in resistance to the Jews, then perhaps we would live in a different reality today. But they rejected the Balfour Declaration, they rejected the mandate, they rejected the partition plan, and ultimately paid the price for that rejection. Three years after the Declaration was published, the Allies gathered in San Remo, Italy to divide the land they had conquered in World War I. Under the San Remo Treaty, the British were now legally obligated to fulfill the promise of the Balfour Declaration. And for the Jewish people, what was once a dream was now part of international law. I'm very proud of it, really, because you know, it was a tremendous humanitarian gesture at the end of the day. It was, it was taking a people who were constantly persecuted in all corners of the earth and at that time, particularly in Russia, and finding them somewhere to go and live, a refuge, a 
place where indigenously the Jews came from, according to the Bible. Two months after the San Remo Conference, the British took control of Palestine. But it would be another three decades after the Balfour Declaration before the Jews would have their state. The Jews needed a home in which to survive, and they fought to achieve it. And sometimes they fought against the British to achieve it. The Balfour Declaration was an opening, but it was the Jews who kept the promise of the Balfour Declaration, not the British. It was the Jews who made it happen. Well, that was a look at the history. If you don't know the history, you can't understand today's headlines. When you understand how uh, it was international law that created the state of Israel, both uh, from the Balfour uh, Declaration, then to the League of Nations, and then finally to the UN in 1948, and then to the um, uh, reunification of Jerusalem, uh, in 1967. If you want to know more about the history of Israel, we've got something for you. It's called In Our Hands, The Battle for Jerusalem. It tells the story of the Six-Day War from the point of view of the soldiers who actually fought the battles. Uh, the 55th Paratrooper Brigade that recaptured Jerusalem, reunified Jerusalem uh, after so many centuries of division, uh, being under control of the Ottomans, the, the Persians, uh, all, all kinds of different empires have controlled Jerusalem. But here it is, back in the hands of the Jews, after 2,000 years after Titus conquered Jerusalem in AD 70. Uh, it's yours for a gift of $10, so if you want to have a copy of it, I'm sorry, it's $15 or more, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Well, after the break, it's been two months since Hurricane Maria flattened the entire island of Puerto Rico. Clean water is an urgent need here, and it has been for a long time. We can't find clean drinking water anywhere. See how Operation Blessing is bringing clean water to those in need and how you can help. All that when we come back. Widespread damage still covers the island of Puerto Rico more than a month after Hurricane Maria devastated the island. But it's what can't be seen that worries doctors. Bacteria in the water could lead to major health problems. Well, Operation Blessing is there, making sure there's clean, safe drinking water. I'm in the Roberto Clemente Coliseum. It's here where the city municipalities have been working out of providing food for the people here in Puerto Rico, but it's also here where Operation Blessing has been working out of since day one after the hurricane. They've been here providing clean, safe drinking water to the people by providing them with filtration systems. So Operation Blessing has got all sorts of amazing tools for purifying water, everything from small family units that we've been distributing to larger units that we can put in a community and they can take even seawater and turn it into clean drinking water, up to 1,800 gallons a day. It couldn't have come at a better time, as at least 76 cases of lipospirosis have been confirmed here. Doctors say the spiral-shaped bacteria found in rodents and other animals tend to spread after flooding. Serious cases of infection can cause organ failure and even death. Clean water is an urgent need here, and it has been for a long time. And Operation Blessing's been here since day one. We're going to continue to provide clean water to the people of Puerto Rico, amongst other things that we're doing to help. So far, Operation Blessing has installed 11 community-sized water filtration systems throughout some of the hardest-hit areas of Puerto Rico. This mess has been a result of the hurricane. Water filled our home, and now we can't find clean drinking water anywhere. Now, thanks to OB, clean water is flowing from Lares in the north to Umacao in the east, to the hospital on the island of Vieques. This is the pharmacy for the hospital. This is the medicine supply for this island of 10,000 people here. And Operation Blessing is helping to keep it going with our generators. In addition to water filtration systems, Operation Blessing crew members are making chlorine. Just salt and water and eight hours of time, gallons of this chlorine solution can be made. Workers say just a capful with every five gallons of water can kill harmful bacteria and make it safe to drink. 
You can make the difference and provide clean drinking water to the people of Puerto Rico. If you'd like to help out, you can visit OperationBlessing.org. Eric Rosales, CBN News, Puerto Rico. If you want to be a part of the relief effort in Puerto Rico, uh, there's an easy way to do it. All you have to do is go to the phone and call us, 1-800-700-7000, and just say, I want to be part of the Operation Blessing Disaster Relief uh, in Puerto Rico. Uh, we've got a special fund that handles our disaster relief efforts that are ongoing in Houston, ongoing in Florida. Uh, you can also write us at CBN Center. Uh, the Disaster Relief Fund, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Or you can go online at Operation Blessings website, ob.org, and just realize if you were in the middle of that disaster and you didn't have access to fresh water, uh, wouldn't, wouldn't you want to have that? And, and we take it for granted. We go to the tap, we turn it on, and there's fresh, clean drinking water. Uh, but for those in Puerto Rico right now, there isn't that. Uh, so we want to be there for them. We want to help them. Uh, and whether it's the earthquake in Mexico City, uh, the horrible hurricanes in Texas and Florida, uh, the horrible hur Hurricane Maria that hit Puerto Rico, uh, people are hurting, people are suffering, and we want to be there. Our motto is that when disasters strike, we want to strike back with love and compassion to let people know God loves them, we love them too. You can be a part of it. Call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from the Bible. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. God bless you, we'll see you again.